welcome to episode 73 of Late Night Linux, recorded on the 30th of September 2019. I'm Joe, and with me are Faylim. Hey, evening. Graham. Hello. And Will. Hello. And here we are, 31 days, eh? Bring it on. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, right, let's get on with some news. And um, the big news of the last couple of weeks um, is Stormen. We missed that for about two hours. Yeah, we did. Uh, there were rumblings when we recorded, I think, last time, but we recorded early and um, the, nothing was sort of confirmed at that point. But there was something of a hit piece written about him because he had said some dumb shit, basically, on an internal MIT mailing list that relates to the whole Epstein thing. Um, some people are calling it a witch hunt, but the bottom line is that it's not new for Stallman to say dumb shit, is it? I mean, he said that basically it's okay to fuck kids as long as they're into it. And he said that years and years ago. And like, it's finally come back to haunt him, essentially. And so he's had to quit the FSF and his position at MIT, but he is stubbornly refusing to quit GNU. He still calls himself the head GNU <laughs> So, hmm. What do we think about all this then? I think he's a, a dinosaur who is living in a strange world of his own creation. He seems to be so detached from reality and, and detached from how the real world works and how people are expected to behave these days that, um, you know, it just seems to have passed him by and he, he just doesn't seem aware of it. And I think it's, well, I don't know. I don't know what I, what I think. It's um, It's a very strange situation and he should not be the figurehead for free software that much, I'm sure of. Kind of painful to watch, to be quite honest, because, I mean, he's got to be, you know, that saying, I'm sure I've heard you say it, Joe, but he's the smartest dumb person in the room. Yeah. Like how you can be that keyed in to, you know, uh, protection of users for their software, all of these very smart things, writing very extreme pieces of code, and then being so thick as to how people actually interact with each other. Um, it's quite amazing, really. Like, Well, people are throwing around the word neurodiversity, but that is not an excuse to act like a dick, as far as I'm concerned. You have to be able to evaluate what other people respond back to stuff and then go, hmm, maybe I should just keep my mouth shut about this and do that one little thing about free software that I do mm. and just do that. I think there's two issues. If There's certainly, we've got to be sensitive to the kind of personality type that he is, but also he was in a position of real import and as such had to... Had to is expected to set an example, um, especially in an industry that is incredibly um, stereotypically, you know, white and male. Um, and yeah, I think um, Will really nailed it with the dinosaur thing. Um, I think it also shows that the FSF, um, you know, was led by Stallman kind of with a, there, there wasn't enough kind of, um, devolution of power even after all this time which would have been a good thing which is a good thing um, and maybe this is an opportunity for something like that to happen because there's there are loads of great people at the fsf well i mean i've heard some other accusations about him which i'm not going to repeat because I, I you know they're not proven but if they are true those other accusations then i think it is best that he's just gone and we back before uh the the, the two of your times on this show graham and will we uh, did have a bit of a rant about Stormen, and you know, at the time we, we we made the point that he's just not a good figurehead for for our movement, and now, especially so. And I think that it is just time to move on. And it feels like free software is moving on and growing up and becoming less. Um, of the, the, you know, boys club or whatever that it was. And some people are saying that, like, oh, it's the social justice warriors taking over. But I'm just, I'm not having that. Like, times change and times have changed. And Stallman belongs to an era that we're just not in anymore. And he has failed, essentially, in his mission. I mean, if you think about it, I was thinking about this today, right? His life's work is to make all software free and to get rid of proprietary software. That's what his ultimate goal has been. And if you think about it, smartphones are now ubiquitous and almost every single one of them is running non-free proprietary software. Windows is still very much the king of desktop computing. And then even in the open source space, in the, the server space, that's all about Linux and open source, two 
terms that he cannot stand. And so really, he must be reflecting on things now, or he should be, as far as I'm concerned, that, you know, he's 66, he's he's tried for the last like 35 years or whatever to make this happen, and it just has not happened. Yeah, and I think I've made the point in the past that had he taken a more pragmatic approach rather than the hardline approach that he sometimes takes, and there's something admirable as well and insightful about that hardline approach, but at the end of it all, there's got to be a compromise that's made that ends up with a more effective result. You know, you've got to try and make a deal. <laughs> <laughs> you know, if it hadn't been so hard line, then maybe the the ideas that were behind some of the things that motivated him would have had more of an effect on, you're right, what has become a very, I mean, I think he has had a huge effect, but the effect isn't the one that he wanted. It, you know, the, the whole technology is driven in fundamentally by a lot of his original ideas, but in a way that's skewed by his lack of flexibility. Well, open source is definitely a huge success, but he's not interested in open source. Mm. And so it's a failure to him. But in reality, it is a great success, really. And without him driving it, maybe we wouldn't be where we are. Yeah, that's a perfect example. He He's so pedantic about the term open source, whereas if he'd kind of accepted that this was it's so much easier to say and so much easier to understand, then he could have, you know, some of his ideas would have been transferred along with that acceptance of the term open source rather than creating what is now a division between the ideology of um, copyleft and what is, is more permissive and open source. Well, the FSF is moving on without him and they've announced the, the free software awards and you can nominate people for that. And in what I can only describe as a facepalm-inducing email, Arthur Torrey has suggested that they nominate Stallman. Now he's <laughs> eligible because he's not working for the FSF anymore. So if that happens and he wins, then that is just, I don't even with that. Maybe that was the plan all along. <laughs> yeah, maybe he wanted this award really badly. <laughs> so he said loads of dumb shit. <laughs> it seems to work for other people. <laughs> <laughs> Uh, what, what the FSF needs is a, a clean break uh, RMS exit. Just get it done. <laughs> <laughs> oh, dear, oh, dear. Um, right, well, that's enough RMS talk for now. Um, let's talk about KDE. Uh, you've got a lot of links here, Phelim. Let's not spend too long on this, please. No, uh, these, are, these are quick. Don't worry. Um, so Academy was on while we were finished up the last episode. And um, there was a few things that came out in that. Um, it was in Milan. Sounded like it was a nice weekend. They reviewed all their work they did on usability, the fact they need to keep talking about it. So that's the work that Nate is doing on his blog is really good. They talked about their new goals for Wayland consistency in the apps. Um, they did a lot of work on security. That was on their, their past three tasks that they had. So they're doing a lot of fuzzing on some of the applications, you know, trying to get people back involved in that. Um, and there was quite a funny one where there was a, a talk by, now I do apologize, Adipta Mehra. This is a terrible butchering of that name, no doubt. Plasma and Mycroft for car control, which I just, I'm so <laughs> tempted to uh, to get that going in the old car. I'll just get a chisel, get in the front of the dashboard and... <laughs> Listen to those dulcet tones of robotic popey. It'll be fantastic. <laughs> It'll tell you all about beans. <laughs> you actually have to put popey in the boot. <laughs> <laughs> well, I mean, he keeps blogging about all this cooking he does now. If you could take a gas stove in the boot with him, then maybe it might actually be quite useful. <laughs> what else then? There is a new website that was teased as part of Academy uh, for the new Plasma desktop and that is starting to look pretty good. Tied in with the new apps web page that was done by John Thurdell, they're, they're really starting to refresh their whole web infrastructure, um, trying to get new people involved and trying to make it look a bit more up to date because a lot of them were starting to look a bit crusty and old and, well, not mid-90s, but mid-2000s. Um, so that's quite good. And then uh, we are about two weeks out from Plasma 5.18, and there's quite a few features in that are quite nice coming along. Um, things like uh, do not disturb mode when you've got a, a mirrored screen setup, which is pretty cool because if you're doing a presentation, you, know, you don't have a whole pile of emails and messages popping up on your monitor while you're trying to do it. 
Um, they're going to keep doing the UX improvements, faster plasma starts, improvements to public Wi-Fi logins, which is kind of cool because I don't know if any of you have been in a hotel and even when you're not using a Linux laptop, it just never seems to fucking work for me. I don't know whether I'm jinxed or what, but you usually have to look at your IP address and then start looking for the least or the, the greatest IP address on that range to see if it's the fucking router <laughs> so you can log into that poxy web page. I don't know what I've done to jinx my laptop so badly, but it just never seems to do it, right? I must say I never have a problem with XFCA. With hotels, it all just works perfectly. Ah, oh, that's right. It just doesn't work. Yeah, okay, good. <laughs> no, it works perfectly well. Thank you very much. So th- they built a specific feature for you into Plasma, and that is the slow to Joe slider, which is the uh, the animation speed. So you can have slow right the way to zero animations, and I'm sure they could filter in some extra features for you there with change wallpapers and stuff while you're at it. But um, I thought it was quite smart. It's very Android-y like, I guess. And I, I would imagine that things like the Pine phone are going to be sort of tying into that because the UX work that they did was a lot of improvements for touch for the widgets as well. So I think um, that they had some talks that were on in Academy that were talked about how the fact that your application is not necessarily going to be running on a PC in the future. Uh, you know, you're going to be on all sorts of devices, uh, whether they be embedded phones or whatever and you know they're trying to prepare for that future so it's, it's quite good to see that i like the um i'm just looking at the new website for the plasma desktop and there's an intro paragraph that makes it sound so wonderful and easy and the best of open source software you click on the get plasma here button and then there's a list of 33 linux distributions <laughs> <laughs> yeah the first one of which is alpine linux yeah. which is perfectly suited to the plasma desktop <laughs> this sounds wonderful <laughs> and then Arch is the second one. <laughs> oh dear. They're getting there. Maybe we haven't quite got there yet. <laughs> Choice is good. Breakfast cereal. Yeah, well, that's the one. <laughs> They've also got three or four BSD uh, distros in there just to troll you, Phelan. And Windows. KD on Windows, of course, yeah. Yeah, well, you can. the apps are getting there. There's three apps in the, in the Windows store now, so slowly taking over. So... With the release of Plasma 18 coming in, it's dedicated to one of the guys that used to be on, um, I don't know if anybody listened to the KD Masters of the Universe podcast back in the, I think it was around 2010, 2011. Um, so that's Guillermo Amaral. And he, I think was from Mexico. And he described himself as an incredibly handsome, multidisciplinary, self-taught engineer. So, you know, modest as well. Um, <laughs> but unfortunately, he lost his battle with cancer last summer. So they dedicate the release to him. So I thought that was quite quite a nice touch. Yeah. Um, so that's, that's pretty cool. So two weeks time, that's coming out. Is that everything for KDE Corner then with a K? Uh, oh, one last thing. Yeah, KDE's moving to GitLab. I'll just slip that one in there. Um, yeah, that happened a while ago. So I think that's kind of good. Uh the old architecture was getting a bit slow and things. So I think that'll be pretty cool and uh, will allow people to interact with KD even easier. Okay, this episode is sponsored by DigitalOcean. Go to do.co slash LNL and you can get $50 credit with 30 days to use it. DigitalOcean offers VMs or droplets, as they call them, in data centers all over the world with really fast network and really fast SSDs. And you can choose from one of the distros that they offer, like Ubuntu, Fedora, Debian, and CentOS, or FreeBSD, or you can use your own custom image. And you can take those distros and build them up exactly how you want. Remember, you've got complete root access to these. Or you can go for one of their one-click apps, like LAMP and LEMP stacks and WordPress, Discourse, GitLab. And these droplets start from as little as $5 a month, and they scale all the way up to huge amounts of RAM and huge numbers of CPU cores, so you can deploy exactly how much you need for the application that you're using. If you need more storage, they've got block storage and object storage, which is really easy to attach to your droplet and just get going straight away. They have cloud firewalls, so you can block network traffic before it even gets to your VM, amazing backups, and a great Teams feature that allows multiple people to work on one droplet without having to share passwords. So go to do.co slash LNL, get your $50 credit, and get started. That's do.co slash LNL. So Pulse Audio is going to get Dolby support, or Dobly, as it would be in Spinal Tap. Oh, if only I could say great in all four corners of the room. <laughs> <laughs> I must say that um, I managed to blag myself a 5.1 system, but I've only got 
the two front speakers for it. So everything goes quiet every now and again when shit's behind. <laughs> He's behind you. No, he isn't. I can hear nothing. Well, that, that's the problem, right? No matter what I select in Pavu Control, it sounds shit. Like it's either too bassy for some stuff, and then I'll be watching some YouTube video and it'll be perfect, and then I'll watch something else, and then it just sounds all fucked up, and I have to change it from 5.1 to 6.1 to 7.1 to 2.1. So... I don't know, maybe this will help. Who knows? Yeah, I think the applications are responsible for telling Pulse Audio what sort of audio stream that they're playing. Um, and so if they don't support that surround sound option properly uh, and the, the exact speaker mapping properly, then this is where you end up with, um, with, with oddities between different applications. So Linux in being shit at audio shocker is what you're telling me. Choice. It's all about choice. <laughs> It is a difficult one to get right. I mean, most people use amps that decode the signal, which is, you know, the amp knows about your speaker placement. I think that makes more sense. But it's really great to be able to decode it in software for times that you need to be able to do that. I think what's exciting about this is the improved pass-through support. So now you're mm. not dependent on your sound card, you know, mapping the speakers correctly or your application mapping the speakers correctly. You just take the um, surround sound audio stream and pass it straight to your amp, and that is going to solve a whole lot of problems. Yeah. Um, I mean, you could do that anyway, but I guess it's... Um you could just ha you just basically had to tell Pulse Audio to ignore the stream as long as it didn't touch the data stream at all. But it's nice that it's an official option. I do use surround sound with Pulse Audio, so but that's just for on my um, Kodi player. And yeah, unless unless I get the pass through working, then nothing works. Yeah, I remember with Myth TV, I would have to try and set up a, a whatever it was a dot pulse audio config file in my home directory to map the exact locations of the speakers, and it never worked, and it was always difficult. So hopefully, this will make things easier. Well, speaking of pulse audio, Leonard Pottering has been up to something new. He's come up with System D Home D, which is a completely new way to look at home directories, which are portable, encrypted, and just just completely modern it's your home directory becomes a file everything is a file right yeah and everything has to be part of system d it seems he was at pains to suggest that it wasn't just having a home directory on a usb stick but essentially it was having the ability to encapsulate your entire home directory and a bit of json describing all the extra bits and pieces on a USB stick or something else, if it happened to be somewhere else. Or just on your laptop's SSD. This was at all systems go. It was kind of trying to say that like all of the horrific bolted together bits and pieces that we've had over the years, like LDAP, the passwords file, shadow file, all the things that people have tried to do themselves, integrating with PAM and all these types of multiple ways of authenticating and telling you what you could and could not do should all come from a proper signed and that is the important thing which i didn't get for quite a while through the talk until somebody asked the question and um, it's all signed in that json file so someone in the it department has to say you are allowed to do all these things you're allowed to be on this machine you can specify particular machines you're allowed to be on in this json file and it's all done in a logical sort of way that's machine readable and, you know, can be extensible as well. Um, and it looks quite interesting. I think, actually, when you really start to think about it, then it's right, you know, to make home directories possibly his next target because they are a mess. I mean, they aggregate so many different kinds of information and thinking that he makes the, the argument about Etsy and Etsy daemon and those kind of state configuration systems that manage to unify lots of configuration files for lots of different apps and it's the same in the home we do have dot local but people still have dot config and then you have dot local share and all those apps and they're just the config files without even talking about where we're going to store our own documents or as, as he says the uids for things i mean the fact that just uids are going to be hopefully dynamic so that if you were in his example to plug a usb stick into another system the uids that you have you're given a new uid for the new system and that's something we must all kind of bang against all the time i do i do worry that um what if the next system that you plug it into doesn't have the same applications installed as a completely different kernel different versions of applications like how is it going to intelligently manage that without shit in the bed 
it's funny you mention that because somebody asked that very question at the end of the Q and A session, and he said, "That's up to your distro." <laughs> so look forward to that pulse audio like shite storm that's gonna fucking hit soon. Um, yeah, no, he said it's it's not part of it, and it's kind of up to the distro to manage that. Um, this is really just about making sure that your home directory is your home directory and contains everything that you wanted and gives you the right amount of access that you expect on a machine. And it's not going to be the only way that you have your home directory. You know, it is going to be up to distros whether they want to use this, at least for now. Yeah, and, and this single file method is essentially because he wants looks to work correctly for an encrypted home directory that when you pause that machine, it actually relocks the home directory and stuff as well. But you can equally have a backend that st- acts like a standard directory system. So even though they might use home system B or system B home, whatever it's called, it can still act and respond exactly like a normal home directory. Yeah, the key with the locks situation now is that when your laptop is sleeping, the encryption keys are held in memory. And so if someone half inches your laptop, you're fucked. Whereas he wants to make it so that you're not. Which is an admirable goal, really. Um, I, I can see the technical arguments for this, but I can also see a lot of traditionalists getting pissed off about this. You know, we, we've seen Debian, you know, being forked to DevOne over the whole System D thing. So I don't think that uh, people are going to swallow this without a bit of a fight. Yeah, I think there's a bigger question, perhaps for another day here, which is uh, around the fact that yeah, you know, the Unix philosophy where you do one tool which does one thing very, very well, um, is that is that model failing with things like System D, where by bringing everything into one uh, container or whatever you want to call it, into one lump, you're better. You're able to better manage and implement features such as this that you can't do in the traditional Unix model. I think that's an interesting discussion for another day, though. I would hope that it's implemented in a modular way so that if it's, you know, your home directory doesn't change to start with, it doesn't have to change. Um, you know, the descriptor says everything that needs to be done and then you can turn on and turn off other bits. But I would really hate it if you lose, if the abstraction that he's uh, proposing means you lose that, that flexibility that makes home such a mess. Um, and that's what I generally don't like about System D and some of it. I still can't get my head around, you know, the the arguments in System D for checking logs. You know, even though I've probably spent longer with System D than within it. Um, I guess just reluctant to change. On to a bit of admin then. And first of all, thank you everyone for supporting us on PayPal and Patreon. It's very much appreciated. And remember that if you support us to the tune of $5 or more per month, you can get an ad-free RSS feed. You can learn about that at latenightlinux.com slash support. And if you want to get in contact, latenightlinux.com slash contact. Now, I keep talking about this, but OGCAMP is coming up very, very soon, October the 19th and 20th in Manchester in the UK. And I'm going to be hosting a panel there, and we need your questions for it. It's kind of an ask-me-anything type situation. If you go to ogcamp.org slash panel, you'll see that there's a Google form there or an email address for people who hate Google like you, Failing. Wise people. Yeah. And you've got a list of the people who are going to be on the panel, Dr. Laura Cowan, Josh Lowe, Caroline Keep, and Dan Lynch. It's funny that Dan Lynch says that uh, bronze 200 meter swimming certificate. That's his <laughs> first thing. <laughs> you can tell that he wrote it. But um, yeah, you get questions about anything. It can be about Linux or just random stuff. This episode is sponsored by CDN77. Go to cdn77.com. And they are a UK-based CDN provider with an end-to-end video processing and delivery platform as their standalone product called Streamflow. They sponsor a bunch of great open source projects like CentOS, KDE, Fedora, Gentoo, and Funtu. And one of their standout clients is the European Space Agency, who use CDN77 to deliver Hubble images all around the world. They're a real innovation leader. They were the first CDN to implement a lot of new features like HTTP2 and Broccoli compression. And they don't outsource anything. Everything's developed and managed by their own team, including their own DDoS protection. And they can push 80 gigabits per second of live streaming through just one machine through their optimizations. All their servers are running Debian, and the vast majority of them are physical machines with an overall network capacity of more than 14 terabits per second. And they've got 35 points of presence in North America, South America, Europe, Asia, and Australia, with daily peaks regularly exceeding 5 terabits per second. 
They've got great 24-7 live support and flexible pricing with both great value monthly plans and pay-to-go options. You can get a 14-day free trial with no credit card needed. And if you do stick with them after that, you can get a 40% bonus if you mention Late Night Linux to sales or tech support. So for example, if you topped up by $1,000, you get $400 on top of that. I hosted the MP3 for an episode of the JRS podcast on CDN77, and it was really easy to set up and link to it, and I had no complaints about the speed from anyone. So go to cdn77.com and start delivering new content. So we teased it last time, talking about home networking. Failing, you've had a bit of drama over the last couple of weeks, so we'll hear about that. And it got me thinking, like, what do you guys do? Because I live in a tiny flat, so I just use my ISP router, which is fine. I get about 400 megabits over wireless, um, which is absolutely fine for me. Um, And because my flat's tiny, I don't need any extra access points or anything like that. But you all live in actual houses. Ooh, very jealous. And so you have to um, sort out proper networking situations. So I just wanted to know what you all do, really. I think I've talked about it before, but my my actual VD, so there's fiber to this place, uh, where it's fiber to the cabinet and then copper from the cabinet to here. So it's VDSL and I use um, OpenWRT because everyone laughed when I said open root. <laughs> <laughs> Fla- flashed onto um, like a generic Net- Netgear DM200. That works really well, but it's basically the, the dumb router that connects the internet to the house because I live in a weird place where whoever... It's a bit of a DIY job on the house, and there's aluminium um, insulation in the walls, which basically means... <laughs> Is it just tinfoil? Yeah, I mean, I basically... Live, it's the perfect place for a tinfoil hat person. You live in a Faraday cage. Yeah, I get no mobile signal in here, and um, you don't really get Wi-Fi from one room to the next a little bit, so... The Wi-Fi solution I've chosen is just a load of... It's like a, it's a mesh, basically, and it works okay, and I've got, like four of them dotted around to be able to get a signal and the house isn't that big it literally is you kind of leave the kitchen and where the router is and uh, I have to use uh, and then I, I got just annoyed with using the same SSID on a few access points and moved to a mesh which has worked um, a Netgear one um, and I, I also use some um, Ethernet over the power line as well for when I really want a proper signal to like the TV which is in the living room um, for streaming because everybody just streams so much. That's about it. But uh, open work works really well. Um, oh, you said it again. <laughs> oh, I'm just going to troll people now. And so is that on the box that's getting the coax straight from the ISP then? Yeah, it it is. I mean, it's it's over the phone line. Ah, right. So it's like DSL style then. Yeah, it's VDSL. Right. Okay. Did you have to uh, desolder or solder anything onto the router board for that to work? I did. I think I talked about it in this podcast. Um, oh, yeah, you did. I think it was a bit of a tricky. It was. It was a tricky job. I think um, a listener emailed us to say they tried it and actually um, bricked a box. So be be careful. It is. It is. It's not impossible, but it's a very fiddly tiny bit that you have to kind of bridge and desolder. Um, that works great. I don't have any stability issues. I did dismantle the open reach box so that I got a little bit of extra speed. And it's, <laughs> hidden, it's hidden behind a kitchen cabinet, so it's absolute nightmare. When the connection goes down, I just start kicking the walls. Did you install a tea tray on the back of it and some neon <laughs> lights? Oh, God. <laughs> <laughs> Mine's a, a bit more complicated. I've got two VDSL lines. Um, I've got when I started working at home, I wanted a backup just in case, uh, you know, one of them went down. Um, and it turns out they've both been very reliable, regardless of which provider they're with. So I've got some some BT um, or OpenReach VDSL modems, um, which convert the phone line to Ethernet. And then those used to go into a, a Raspberry Pi um, with a USB Ethernet adapter on it. So I had two Ethernets in and then just some IP tables rules to do um, load balancing, sort of pseudo load balancing between those two two lines. Um, general web browsing, you wouldn't get double the speed, but if you're doing something which is able to pull down from different IP addresses, for example, you know, downloads or something like that, um, then you would be able to get the benefit of, of both of those. Um, and then for Wi-Fi, I was just using bog standard cheapo Wi-Fi access points all with the same SSID. And I was never really happy with the performance. I put one up in the loft, as high up in the house as I could get it, and that gave the best coverage across the whole house. 
but there were still sort of dead spots. Um, so it was never really working as well as I really wanted it to. Um, and then one day the Raspberry Pi blew up or the SD card died or something and I lost my, my scripts. Um, I had them backed up, but they were a bit out of date. Um, but I just thought I can't be asked with this anymore. I, I don't really want to be writing IP tables rules and um, you know managing all that myself. So I looked around and the Ubiquiti networking um, range was very well recommended. Um, so I got one of their little Edge X routers, which has got, I think, two, it's got two WAN interfaces or maybe it's got five interfaces that you can configure however you like. And their Unify Wi-Fi access points um, set up as a mesh, and I've been extremely happy with it. Um, you can get the um, controller software. I think it's, hmm, I think it's open source. It's certainly a Java um, app, and you can uh, add a um, an apt archive for Debian or for Ubuntu and, and install that. Uh, that controller software, um, and I've been very pleased with it. So pleased, in fact, that I recommended Phalim should have a look at it. Yes, and why would I need one? Well, so I have Virgin. Uh, It's a business line, so it means I get to pay more money and don't get any of the TV stuff, which is fucking brilliant. I do get a fixed IP, but that comes into some Cisco EPC, well, I don't know, 29-something or other. It's a crappy uh, firewall, but it's in bridge mode and technically does wireless, but no, just not using that yoke. Um, but to it, I got my own piece of kit called a PC Engines APU. Um, that's a bit old these days. There's an APU 2 out now. Um, so that's made by, it's like, a, it's a special router board manufacturer and essentially it runs PFSense on it. It's got three interfaces and uh, I only use two of them. And uh, that's, that's a decent bit of kit. Can go up to full gig. I mean, I've only a 200. Uh, down and a 20 up line um it's fine it's nothing spectacular but it does a job and i had bought an ethereus wireless card with that and this is where bsd is shit (laughs) uh, because the drivers are shit and it never really sort of worked very well so the wires was always flaky so i ripped the internal one out and I got a, a cheapy TP-Link WA90, essentially a thing with two aerials and was white and did the job and that was fine. And I could just plug it into the switch and it was just an access point. That was all fine until I started feeding a local wildcat and our cat got really hacked off, walked under the stairs where all the comms gear is and then pissed all over the wall there <laughs> and uh, both covered a UPS and the access point in piss. <laughs> I didn't realize this at the time, walked in there and went, why is the fucking wireless not working? Because Liam, my son, was going, uh, watching something on kids' YouTube or whatever it is, and he went, oh, the Wi-Fi's not working. I was like, oh, for fuck's sake, I'm going to go in there. And I was going in there, I pressed reset and the lights were on, but not all of them. And I thought, what the fuck is wrong with this thing? And why is it wet? And then I realized, (laughs) something's up here. How did water get here? So I started looking up under where, because the hot water tank is technically above that, about a floor up. And I was like, shit, is that thing leaking? No, it wasn't. Apparently it smelled. I couldn't smell it. And then I noticed a pool of piss all around the UPS. And I thought, fuck, I better turn that off. So I flicked the switch on that. Of course, it's a UPS. What did it do? It went into battery mode. And I thought, oh, fuck, it's still going to kill me if I fucking get wet. So I was busy with the the woolly oven gloves trying to pick a live UPS soaked in urine whilst trying to put it into a giant Tupperware box and then plonking it out in the middle of the garden because I was sure it was going to go up like a fucking Catherine wheel at any point um so yeah unsurprisingly that access point didn't work after that amazingly enough and uh yeah and that's where will said get one of these lads and i tried my best not to buy one because i thought fuck it i can just get a replacement for this thing but every single one i look for they're all these online accounts you require and you have to it has to talk online to their service i just thought it just seems so bizarre to be like configuring my router through a a cloud-based service for something that's internal on my network. So it really annoyed me. But eventually I went, right, I'll get the, um, I got the uh, Ubiquiti Networks. It's a UAP AC light because it's sort of for our house's house, but it's not a shadow, let's put it that way. (laughs) So I reckon I could get one of these at least. It was a house to us. Um, So I got uh, one of these with the idea that I could get a second one if I needed to. 
so I down I got that. I downloaded the piece of software, which is a deb file, um, and that's to run the controller software. And you can run that on anything. And I I had a uh, Raspberry Pi lying around that was picking up my weather station. So I said, oh, just fire it on that. It's doing fuck all anyway. And yeah, that was dead easy to do. Nice interface, very easy. It picks up the AP point, and yeah, uh, it's got um, AC and then. B and G, I think is, or is it N and G? N and G, I think, on the other one. And ironically enough, I've some somehow discovered that all of my devices are the shitey slow ones, and my wife's are the two good ones. So she's got her own private network, essentially, up on the five uh, megahertz band. So uh, it's a two class network in our house, really. And it detected the fact that it was actually one of the pies that had a dodgy USB dongle that was actually fucking up the Wi Fi all along, and maybe that a theorist card was actually fine and it was just the pie that was bringing the whole lot down but uh it's great it worked really well is there any source card for that deb then i don't think so i don't know for sure i mean they are quite good for saying if there's gpl code they'll allow you to it and i just i can't really tell if there is mm. it's a java app so i think you can get at it pretty easily but um yeah i haven't actually looked for the source I'm a bit surprised that you lot aren't going for sort of enterprise Cisco gear and stuff. I know it's very expensive. Ah, but this is though. That 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 is the funny thing about the the Ubiquity gear. It is actual proper enterprise. And you can tell by the fact that it's got a PoE injector in the box for this thing that looks like a smoke alarm essentially. Mm. And that's got a wall a proper wall mounting or ceiling mounting kit for the uh, access point. And then even the PoE injector has a metal plate to mount to the wall. I mean it's it's not home shitey gear equipment mm. it's and it, like it really does work and the management options you get on that whatever you call it management interface um are really impressive as well you get you can turn on deep packet inspection you can do band steering so that you can you know um, tell clients that they should really be preferring five gigahertz if they can do it um you get graphs all the sort of good stuff there um, it's yeah it really is enterprise level in my opinion is it enterprise cost? Far from it. Yeah, this this AP. I mean, I, I still wanted to keep my firewall, but if you did go, say, the way Will went and you have a gateway device as well, then it all ties together really nicely. And I think they're quite cheap, but the AP was uh, about 70 quid. Yeah, I think the access points is about 70 quid. The, the router itself, I think, was 50 quid, something like that. So if you're buying one access point, it's not too bad. I, I ended up with three because um, we put another wing on uh, Wizzy Towers. <laughs> and I, I probably didn't need three, but uh, it, it did the job. So it was a little bit more expensive. It allows the staff to have good Wi-Fi while they're supposed to be doing the cleaning. <laughs> but, yeah, they, they get a bit pricey when you start adding them. But, yeah, the... Just the, the the roaming between access points as well is so fast. I've had um, Telegram calls or WhatsApp calls or whatever on Wi-Fi, and I've I know I've roamed from one access point to another, and the cutover time is you know half a second or something like that. It's really impressive. Right. Well, I suppose we better get out of here then. We'll be back in two weeks when hopefully we'll all be together again. But until then, I've been Joe. I've been Phelan. I've been Graham. And I've been Will. See you later. <laughs>